Okay, so hi everybody, thank you for attending this talk. The huge irony in life is that at the moment I'm very stressed because I don't want to sound bored to you, which is precisely the topic of this talk, so hopefully it's going to be okay. So before I continue, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Fernando, I have worked seven years as a developer in Brazil in a small studio. Then I switched jobs, I went to the academia where I became a lecturer of computer science, and for the last three years, I have been working at the University of Harvard as a PhD student conducting research on humans and emotions and games. And the result of these three years of work is what I'm going to present to you now. So I'm going to sound very, very old by saying this, but in the 90s, when you could not download a game, you actually have to go to a store to get something. You could go in a store in my city and you could rent a cartridge. And if you rent it on a Friday, you could actually return this only on Monday. So you have 48 hours to play a game. So that was awesome. So I usually went there on a Friday to get a very cool game. And my life forever changed when I was introduced to one very specific game, which was this one, which is called Contra 3. So Contra 3, you play as a soldier or two soldiers that are trying to uh, release Earth from an alien invasion. And this is a very fast-paced platformer game. And you can play in two difficulty modes, if I record correctly. Maybe you have more ways of playing this. So the first mode you can actually play Contra is the hard mode. So in the hard mode, exactly everything on the screen is trying to kill you at the same time, mercilessly. So you have to very accurately time your actions and shoot to the right thing so you will not die. The second mode is the insanely hard, where everything is trying to kill you and your friend as well. So if you play together, you have the friendly fire, so you have to pay attention to the enemies and to your friends. And of course, this is a very, very stressful game, but for me, I enjoy it a lot. First, because I could play throughout the weekend and I would not be able to finish the game, so I would have to rent the cartridge the next weekend and play it again and again and again. And because I like stressful games, I really enjoy being challenged to the most that I can actually handle. So I enjoy these kind of games. But I am just one type of gamer. We have many types of gamers. For instance, like this one, Donna Sonia, my mother-in-law. She's 67 years old and she's an avid gamer. She plays every day, but she does not play the games that I play. For instance, those are two of her favorite games. She enjoyed anything that looks like Bejeweled, and she enjoys playing Tibia. I really don't know if you guys know about Tibia, it's a very old game. So she's level 470 in Tibia, which is not bad for, for a lady of her age. But when she plays Bejeweled, she managed the pressure so flawlessly that I, I, I got mesmerized when I see her playing. Because she sees the times and she doesn't care. She just looks for the matches, for the bonuses, and she continues to do it. When I play Bejeweled, I get freak out if I see the time going down. And I cannot see the matches anymore, and I quickly die. And when she plays Tibia, she does not enjoy this kind of pressure. She likes to chill out. She's very high level, so she goes and quests, kills some monsters, and then she, that's, that's it for her. And sometimes when my wife calls her, she said, oh, honey, I cannot take the phone call right now I'm in the middle of a quest, which means that she's really focused into the game. She does not want to be disturbed. She wants to chill in the game. And you can see that we are very different gamers, but somehow we are just trying to look for fun. So I ask you, what would happen if a game could actually detect our emotions and self-adapt to give us the best experience ever? So I wouldn't have to choose the difficulty mode, and my mother-in-law wouldn't have to choose as well, and we could play the same game and we could enjoy the same amount of fun. So in fact, detecting human emotions is so important and so interesting that we can apply it to other fields, not only game development, that this has been trying to be reached by scientists over the last decades, the several last decades. And this is usually how you do it to detect a human emotion. First, you have what we call the emotion elicitation material, who could be a set of audio, video, or images, and they are designed in a way to cause you an emotional reaction. Could be like a video of a fun cat, could be a picture of something that is disgusting or sad, but it's meant to cause you an emotional reaction. Then you expose a set of people to those emotional reactions, material, and these people in this group, they will react to that. And luckily they will react according to the emotion that you have designed the material. And then they will produce a set of signals, and we call them psychophysiological signals. So they could be facial expressions, they could be heart rate changes, breathing changes, temperature of the skin, and so on. And then somehow we have to take a look at these signals and map them into the emotional state that we are trying to provoke in those people. Usually, machine learning is used to do this mapping. So machine learning is a technique in computer science that tries to 
You teach the machine to understand what is happening in a set of signals, try to recognize a set of patterns, and then map and make sense of those patterns into some meaningful information. In our case, it's the emotional state of a person. And then we have the emotional state, which is what we are trying to actually detect. But there are a few problems with this. And the first one I ask you is that, what happens with the individuality? We are very unique creatures. We have different backgrounds, we have different cultural expectations, we have different types of players and different ways of playing games. So if you think about a group, how can you be sure that you are putting in that group enough people to represent the whole humankind? How do you know that you are not leaving someone out, like my modeling law or like myself, that likes very stressful games, or like Herc, that likes easy going games. So we need a lot of people. So in reality, we would need the whole mankind to be there, to be examined, so we can have a machine learning model that describes this. But it's completely impractical. We, we don't have the money to do it. The second problem is about the signal acquisition. We need very good signals in order to actually detect the emotional state of a person. And we can discuss about this. We can go through the psychology path and discuss emotions in the psychological thing. But you can also Going back to biology, I mean, you can see emotions and as manifestations of the physiology of the human being. So there are s several signals that our body emits that are connected to emotions. One of them is facial expressions. We use them nowadays, every day, actually. You could be looking at me thinking like, okay, this is fun or this is not fun. And I could be pretending to be something here that I might not actually be feeling. So facial expressions, even though they are good and they are accurate manifestations of emotions, they are easily fakeable. So you can fake a facial expression very easily. But there are other signals that are not so easily fakeable. For instance, the heart rate. Actually, the heart rate is connected to a system in our brain called the autonomic neurological system. So it's the system that controls our vital signs, whether we like it or not, is going to do its thing. And when we have an emotional reaction, so when you are facing, for instance, a threatful situation, your body is going to receive a lot of chemicals that are going to make you really sharp and really aware of the environment. So you can stay and fight, or you can run like there's no tomorrow. And this reaction is biologically known as the fight or flight reaction. So we can actually exploit this, use this in our favor, and know that the heart rate is going to change based on our emotions. So if we can track the heart rate, we can actually use this to detect emotions. If you have the unpleasant encounter with a hospital and you have your heart measured in a hospital, you probably have one of those in your finger. So this is a heart measurement device which uses something called a photoplephismography. So photoplephismography is measuring the heart rate just not by cutting open someone and looking at the heart, but by checking how much light is absorbed by the blood flow that is flowing through your veins and arteries. So what we have is that the more oxygen we have in the blood flow, the more light is absorbed. So if you have a light emitter, for instance, on top there, and then we have a light sensor on the bottom, at sometimes you're going to detect more light because you have less oxygen flowing through the blood, and sometimes you're going to detect less light because we have more oxygen there. So if we count these up and downs in the oxygen, you can actually see your heart pumping oxygenated blood through the veins and arteries. And this is a very efficient way of detecting the heart rate. But we have a problem with this. Heart rate is really good for us to detect emotions, but it's really bad if we have to use sensors. Nobody wants to be wired up to play. I don't want to have something in my finger as I play. It will disturb how I handle the control. If I'm using a keyboard, it will get in my way. So sensors are not ideal. And on the other side, they have costs. So you need to buy something new just to wire you up to have your heart rate detected. So even though they are very good at detecting heart rate, they are impractical in our sense. So we need something that is better than this, something that we can deploy right now and can be used to detect emotions. And that is where computer vision enters the scene. Computer vision is a field of computer science that tries to make computers see the world as we see it. So instead of analyzing an image and seeing only values, a set of pixels, computer vision tries to give context to those pixels. For instance, this set of pixels here represent a face. This set of pixels here represent an object. And we can use that information to make better applications to actually contextualize things. And you are actually using computer vision quite a lot on a daily basis. If you use any of those Instagram filters, they're all based on computer vision. If you have auto tag of friends and Facebook, for instance, they're also based on computer vision. And computer vision has evolved so much in the last years that nowadays we can actually detect the tiny parts of the face using computer vision. So we can analyze a face on a pixel level 
For instance, the, the makeup filter that you have on Instagram, you actually deform the face of a person on a pixel level, and it looks very realistic. When we bring this idea of computer vision into the field of emotion detection, we can try to do some very unique things. For instance, if you look at the face of a person with the naked eye, you will never see that the color of the face of that person is changing over time because of the amount of oxygen that is flowing underneath and is causing light to be reflected differently. So if we use computer vision, and we can, to detect variations on a pixel level, we can actually measure this amount of light that is being reflected, and we can use this to estimate the heart rate. So this technique of detecting the heart rate using computer vision has been proposed by scientists of the MIT around 2010, 2011, and it works roughly like this. First, you detect the face. Then in the face, you detect a region of interest, the ROI. And then the ROI is usually the central part of the face where you know the signal is there that you can actually use. And then you calculate something within the ROI. In this case, is the average of all the red pixels you have there, the average of all the green pixels and all the blue pixels. And if you do this for every frame of a video, you will end up with a signal at the end. In this case, you have the red signal, the green signal, and the blue signal. And after you have those signals, you apply some math in it. In this case, it's something called independent component analysis, which will look into a set of signals and try to extract hidden information that is there. In our case, it's the heart rate. But if we end up with several signals, which we call the separated sources. Then you apply a little bit more of math, and you select one of those as being the heart rate. In this case, it's the separated source number two. And then we can estimate the heart rate of a person just by looking at that person and pointing a camera to that person. This is as close as dark magic as we can get with computer vision. And actually doing this is awesome, but it's very tricky. Because if you think that we are actually detecting the variations of light, if a person slightly changes the angle of the face, you're going to make light to reflect differently. And this is going to think, the algorithm is going to think that this is the heart rate changing. But no, this is just the person moving. Or if the light source, for instance, this one here, is moving around, then the reflections on my face are going to change. And this is going to change how we measure the heart rate. So doing this is actually very tricky, and scientists have been trying to perfect this technique in the last few years. And nowadays, we are pretty good at doing this. Actually, we have a very good accuracy at detecting the heart rate. But as people move, we tend to have a lower detection of the heart rate because of this. We introduce a lot of noise into the system. And that is where my research comes in. What happens if we bring this remote detection of viral signs into the field of computer games, into the field of games research? If we apply this way of detecting signals and trying to detect the emotions of players, can we actually detect what a person is, uh, is feeling just by not touching the person, just by looking at that? And after three years of work, I came up with a method that we can actually try to detect the emotional state of a person. And this, is, this method is based on two phases. The first phase you see here is called the calibration phase. So in this phase, the person is exposed to a set of games. So since I'm trying to detect emotions in a game, I'm using games as emotional elicitation material. So they play the sort of calibration games, which I'm going to explain in a while. And then as you play this game, you are filmed by a camera. And then the camera produces a video feed. And then this video feed is analyzed using computer vision. And I extract a set of psychophysiological signals from those, like facial actions, what you are doing with your face, and estimate the heart rate using the technique that I said before. And then I use those signals into a machine learning model that tries to learn how you behave when you play the games. So I'm trying to see how you have an emotional profile and learn about your emotional profile. And the result of this is a user-tailored model. And you, I call this user-tailored because only one person is being used in the training process. So I'm trying to bypass the whole idea of using a group. I'm using one person to design a machine learning model that detects emotions for that person. So there's not no one in the universe that knows better than myself about emotions than myself, which is a reasonable idea. This idea of calibration games is that those games are designed in a way to cause two very specific emotional states, boredom and stress. And they try to account for the individuality. They try to cause those two emotional reactions in a right range of people. So at first, the games have not many things for you to do, and you emphasize the waiting time. So as you wait for something to happen, 
you tend to become bored because there's not many things happening. But then endlessly and continuously, the game increases the difficulty. So over time, you're going to have more and more and more elements that you have to deal with. And in one point in time, you're going to have so many things on the screen that you are going to feel stressed. And this time is going to be different for me, for my mother-in-law, and for each one of you. We have different expectations in games, different gaming skills, and then we're going to be stressed in different times. But the important part is that if you follow a calibration game, you will feel bored at some time, you will enjoy the game at some time, and you will feel stressed at some point. And you have so many things that further up in the road that you will not be able to deal with it, and then the main character will die and the calibration game will end. So this is hopefully a way for me to see the whole emotional spectrum that you can have when you play this calibration game. So I can use this information to create a model that tries to detect the emotions of each person. After we have this model, then we can apply it to any other game. For instance, here I'm playing an ordinary game, Tetris. And as I play that game, I don't have any sensors on me. I just point a camera to that person, get the video feed, apply computer vision again, extract those signals as before, the facial actions and the heart rate. And then I feed those signals into the previously trained machine learning model. And this is going to use the previous information, my emotional profile, and say, OK, based on your current heart rate and the way you are moving your face, you look like you are stressed. So you are probably stressed as you play this game. Or you are bored. So now I would like to tell you how I end up with this method, if it actually works, and what is the research behind it. So everything is started with the first experiment that I conducted. So we have this idea of calibration games, but we have to test it. Can we actually design a game to cause this emotional reaction that we can use to create an pro emotional profile of a person? So I designed three calibration games. So it's a puzzle game, a platform, and a Tetris, Tetris version. So in this puzzle game, you have a set of mushrooms. So you have to drag the right mushroom to feed the monster, and you have to drag the wrong mushroom to the trash, which is a poisonous mushroom. So at first, you have just two mushrooms and plenty of time to do it. When you select the mushrooms and you drag, then the time goes down. You have to wait a bit. Then you have more mushrooms, and again, a, sort, a certain time to fit in finish the task. But as the time progresses, we have more and more and more mushrooms, and the time becomes shorter and shorter and shorter. So at some point in time, you have so many mushrooms and so little time to do it that you will feel stressed. In this platformer game, you have to collect hearts and avoid obstacles. At first, plenty of hearts, lots, actually, very few obstacles. But then you have many obstacles and almost no heart. And for this status here, at first, the pieces fall very slowly, and you cannot speed them up. So you have to wait for a piece to go from the top to the bottom. But as time progresses, the pieces fall faster and faster and faster until the point that one piece is taking like one second to go from the up part of the screen to the bottom part. So with those three calibration games, I designed a lab-like environment like this. It's a room where my subjects were seated and playing those games, and they were being filmed throughout the whole thing. And as they play each calibration game, I ask them to answer a questioner. Like, how stressed are you at the beginning of this game and at the end of the game? And how bored were you at the beginning and at the end of the game? So I could validate this idea of calibration games. I would like to know if they were actually feeling what I meant with the games. And I also ask them to wear a watch that was measuring the heart rate. So I collect a lot of information about the heart, game, or the heart rate of each subject throughout the sessions. After I finished the experiment, I analyzed the data and I performed a set of studies to better understand this and try to come up with something that can actually detect emotions. So my first study was about seeing what people do with their faces when they play. So I manually analyzed all the video recordings of my experiment, which were six hours of video recordings, and I took notes of everything that people do when they play. And in fact, people do very crazy stuff when they play games. Like, they tend to bite their lips, they bite their tongues, they show their tongues, they smile, they move their lips to the left, to the right. They do a lot of things. But most importantly for me in this case was that I performed some statistical analysis and I could have the confirmation that all my subjects perceived the games as being boring at the beginning and stressful at the end, which was great. So I knew that this idea of calibration games actually worked, and I could use this to produce an emotional profile of each person. The most important part is this. This is how a subject looked like when he, he, in this case, myself, is bored and when this person is stressed. We are rock solid when we play games. Even though we have emotions and we have facial expressions, most of the time we remain with a neutral face, which was a huge surprise to me. I expect to just look at the person playing the game and say, okay, you are playing the stressful part or you are playing the boring part, but it's not true. 
most of the time we remain like this. So it's not obvious to say what a person is feeling just by looking at the face. So that was a huge surprise and I have to take this into account. Second, I did study number two, which was about the heart rate. So I knew the games were causing some emotions. I would like to see if the heart rate was actually changing. So I knew the, game was, the games were being perceived as boring at the beginning and stressful at the end, so I calculate the average of the heart rate at the beginning and at the end, and I compare them both. And using statistical analysis, I confirmed that the heart rate on those two points in time were different, which means that when people play the calibration games, they were actually having a physiological reaction to the game. When they were bored, the heart rate was lower, and when they were stressed, the heart rate was higher. This is not new to science, but it was very good for me because I knew that my calibration games were actually causing this reaction. They were connected to this psychological reactions that I was expecting them to have. After I had these, I knew that people remain with neutral faces. I knew the heart rate was changing, so I was about to do the remote readings of the heart rate. Can I actually detect the heart rate as people play? Because when we play, we do a lot of things. Games are very emotional material. So we tend to curse when we do wrong moves. We tend to cheer when we do good stuff. So we tend to move a lot. And this movement causes the estimation of the heart rate to be very challenging to be conducted. So in this study number three, I got the whole videos of the, my subjects playing the games, and I applied a computer vision technique to try to extract the heart rate. And I compared this value with the value that I had with the watch that people were playing. So the watch was a physical sensor, and it acted as ground truth in my case. And when I compared them both, I could see that the values were feasible. So they were kind of similar. If you just look at the heart rate using computer vision, the estimation by the computer vision, the error was between three bits per minute. So I could actually detect the heart rate within a range that was still within what I needed to detect the emotions of a player. But the most important takeaway from my study number three is that people move. As I said, people tend to talk a lot as they play. They tend to occlude the face with the hand when they are bored or when they are stressed. And all this adds a lot of noise and a lot of problems for the emotion detection because the facial detection mechanism goes bananas when you have a face in your uh, hand in your face. So I have to deal with this. So I have to take this into account. But the important part was that I could actually detect the heart rate. So then I end up in study number four. So I knew the heart rate was different. I knew people remain with neutral faces. I knew facial actions were actually happening. And then I decided to do after the facial expressions. But I read a lot and facial expressions, as I said, are fakeable. So I needed something better. So I tried to look at the details that we have when we play a game. What are the things that are changes in our faces that are connected to emotions? So I read a lot of scientific papers that connect some facial muscles through emotional reactions. So I went after those muscles. I applied computer vision to try to detect this set of muscles that are connected to emotions. In our case, like the muscles around the eye, the muscles around the mouth. So I end up developing a set of set of facial features that are connected to emotional reactions in the face. They're not facial expressions. They are just the movement, for instance, for your eye, the, eye, the area of your eye, how your eyebrow move, how your corner of your mouth move, and then I analyze all the videos using this computer vision technique that I have developed. And I have a confirmation as well that those features, they are different when people are stressed and then when they are bored. So that was great for me because I can use those information then to tell if a person is stressed or it's bored. This is about two and a half years of work already. So I finally arrived to the point in time that I have everything in place. I could estimate the heart rate, I could analyze the faces using computer vision, so I could, for the first time, see can I actually detect the emotion of a person instead of just analyzing everything about that person. So what I did is that I, each of my subjects played the three calibration games. So I used two of those calibration games, apply the computer vision, extract the signals, and use this to train a machine learning model, in my case, a neural network. And then I applied this model on the third game that this person has played. And since this was a calibration game and the person perceived the game as being boring at the beginning and stressful at the end, I applied my model in this game and tried to see if I could detect this. Can I actually tell what this person is feeling according to what this person has said when he or she played the game? And for my surprise, and my happiness actually for my PhD, this worked. So the results were feasible. So for the first time after three and two and a half years, I could actually see that this was something that could work in the future. 
But I also learned something. If you use a combination of signals, heart rate and facial actions, this performs better at detecting emotion than just using facial information or only the heart rate. So it tells us how complex human beings are. We need lots of data in trying to infer the emotional state. Even for us, not a machine, looking at the face of someone is really hard to tell what that person is feeling. So when I have this confirmation that my method was actually feasible, we decide to replicate these studies in a larger scale. We decide to design a new experiment and have more people play the games and try to detect their emotional reactions. So for this idea, for this experiment, I performed the three calibration games as before. So my subjects would go there, play the three calibration games. I would use computer vision, extract the signals, train the model, and have a model to detect the emotions of that person. So I need to apply this to a game. So in this case, it needed to be a commercial game or a game that was very similar to a commercial game. So this game needed to be widely known. I didn't have to explain how the person should play that game. It should be very easy, should be very enjoyable. The person could easily have fun and somehow feel a bit bored a middle along the way. So I decided to select one very famous game, which is Mario, which I think is a perfect game for this. So I designed seven levels of Mario. Actually, I was not the one designing. I'm using something called Infinite Mario, or the levels are generated procedurally. So I just tweak this to have the same levels for our subjects. And then I use game designers to help me design those levels. So I have levels on the overground, for instance, like the first one, which were designed to be a little bit easier. I have levels in the underground, where they are a bit more challenging, but still not that hard. And I have some levels that were in the castle environment. So these were really stressful because as soon as you start the game, after 10 seconds, you, you listen to the hurry up message and then the music game starts to play faster. The gaps in those levels were also wider to try to induce the person to feel a bit more stress. So we try as best as we could to keep those levels as close as possible to Mario. So those would be very similar levels from the original commercial game. So I could actually see if my method was working on a commercial game. And then, when each subject played the games and played the Mario, I also asked them, how stressful was this Mario level? How boring was this Mario level? So I could have the confirmation if the person was feeling something in that level, and I could use that information to test if my method was actually working. So if someone said that that particular level was stressful for that person, my method should say the same. That level is stressful. That person is feeling stress as this level is being played. And again, I perform everything remotely. None of the time the person was being touched by a sensor or touched by something for a wire. Everything was being done remotely using only a camera and a computer. And then we arrive to this question, did it work? And the result is kinda. So we can see here's a distribution of the accuracy of my method when applied to all my subjects, the 62 subjects that I had in my experiment. So on average, my method worked with 62% of accuracy in detecting the emotional state of a person. It means that in 62% of the cases, I could tell correctly if you were stressed or bored. But if you take a look at the distribution of that accuracy, you can see towards the right side that my method worked really, really well for some subjects. For instance, there was one person where my method worked with 100% accuracy, which means that I could actually read the mind of that person as he or she was playing Super Mario. My method was also able to detect the emotional state of a person with accuracy of 90%, 85%, 80%, 75%, 70%. 70 there were also some problems, like there are some subjects, like two subjects, where my method was performed with 20% accuracy, which means that my method was worse than just flipping a coin and knowing if that person was stressed or not. So those are questions that I don't know why at the moment. We have to further research this, but it's very interesting. What, what happened with this method that for some people it works so well and for others it works so bad and have those ugly numbers. And in the end, I developed a software that uses this computer vision technique that I said and extract this set of psychophysiological signals and can be used to estimate the emotions of a person. So you can see here this software working. So in this case, the software is analyzing my face and you can see the red dots there, they are called facial landmarks, so those are the facial points that are being recon recognized by the computer vision. And then those points are being used to calculate a set of signals. For instance, you can see lots of green lines and yellow lines there. Those are all signals related to the face. They are like the distances between my eyes, where I'm looking at, if I'm blinking, if I'm smiling, if I'm twisting my mouth to the left or the right. 
And on the bottom, you can see that my heart rate is being estimated using the technique that I said before. So this technique is working at 13 frames per second. So it's not like real time, but it's close to be very fast. So you don't have to wait hours to have the results. You can just apply this to a game. And then we can use all that information that I calculate here to try to train a machine learning model to detect the emotions of a person, as I said before. OK, and then we arrive to the conclusion. What can we actually learn about from this? So I can say that when I start this project, I have no clue that this would actually work. And if I had a clue, this would not be researched, and I would know that it's going to work. So I needed to go after the, the ghosts in this case. So I, I faced lots of problems. Some of the problems were good, like I could solve them, and they were not like bogging me. Some of them were very weird, like people remaining with a neutral face most of the time. That was a huge surprise. I would expect that people laugh and smile when they play, but they don't. In fact, I have a subject that remained with a rock-solid face through all the 45 or 30 minutes of gameplay. So it means that it's very, very hard to extract information out of human beings. So that's why this technology is, is so nice. The second thing is that computer vision has evolved so much throughout the last years that nowadays we can perform some very complicated tasks even on a mobile phone. Mobile phone. And to perform this technique that I d demonstrated, detecting the heart rate, you actually don't need a very powerful camera. You can use any sort of camera. The camera from this notebook, for instance, it works. The camera from my phone works. The camera that you have, a regular camera, it works as well. We don't need any special thing. We just need to point a camera at someone and then apply computer vision, and we can actually detect the emotional state of that person. And I think just by looking at someone, even though my numbers were not great, even just by looking at someone and guessing if you were bored or stressed with a reasonable amount of certainty, that's really awesome. Imagine what we can actually do in the future. We can have games that will self-adapt and give us the best experience we have. So as this technology matures and develops and we have this in the living room, we will not have sensors around. We just have a camera. And we already have, for instance, you have a Kinect at home, you already have a camera looking at you. So we just have to empower that camera to detect your psychophysiological signals and then try to extract emotions and then do this. And I also imagine what game designers could do if they have one more variable when they design the game, the emotional side of a person. What game can we actually do when we have the emotion of a person? Not only guessing if the person is going to be sad or happy or stressed at that moment. What happens if I know you are feeling stressed? I could slow the game down. I could play a different music. I could use this. I could use this momentum. If you are bored, I can make fun of this. We can have fun together. If you are stressed, maybe I can make this game awesome to you. Even though you are not a person that enjoys stress, I can make this game enjoyable for you as well. So I'm really excited to see this development in the future and I'm really looking forward to see what the future holds and I hope you guys are as excited as I am to see this in the future. So that will be all. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think we have time for some questions. Uh, hello. hello. Uh, I have a question about the chart that you have shown. Uh, uh, sorry? A I have a question about the chart that you have shown that shows uh, the stress and uh, yep. the boredom. Is it necessary that uh, they are in inverse relationship? I mean, would it be possible that someone is not stressed and still is enjoying what he's doing? I mean... Yes, it is possible. We have to choose something that we could actually measure. So in my case, there has been research published saying that if you emphasize weight, you cause boredom. And if you overwhelm the person, you tend to cause stress. So those were two emotional states that I could actually detect and try to do it. But there's no way for me to tell if someone is actually not stressed at the middle. The person could be enjoying. But the hopefully, as the time progresses and the difficulty progresses, it will never stop progressing. At some point, I expect you to feel stress. So it's, it's a hope, it's not a certainty. So as you said, it might be that a person is actually enjoying the game and then the game will end. So this is a possibility, but I, there's no way for me to know what the person is actually feeling for real. When I ask uh, the questioner, it's, the person is going to reply, how stressful was the game? She could say that it was not stressful at all. Then I cannot use this method for that person. 
uh, in particular? Uh, okay, well, what I mean, uh, we are actually, uh, you are actually able to measure stress, but you cannot measure if he's bored or not. So, and you have assumed that since he is stressed, he will not be bored and the inverse. That's what I'm asking about. That there is one dimension that you cannot really measure if the person is bored or not. You, you can simply measure if he's stressed or not, and then you are deducting if he's bored or not from this measure. Yeah, we can discuss about emotions in a psychological way, as I said, but you, you have to see this as a manifestation of physiology. So in my case, stress is when you have more physiological signals going up, and you are bored when you have psychological physics going down or staying stable. So that's how I, I interpret them. It's not more the psychological side. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, could, currently, you're only looking at the face, so you mentioned when they put up their hand, it messed things up. Yes. Do you think you could extend that so you take the hands into account, so if they, if they cover their eyes, that's a sign of some emotions? I, yes, we can. I have in my to-do list to detect the hand and maybe use it in the future. Even if you occlude your face somehow and not completely, if you like cover one of your eye, I can still detect the facial landmarks. And if your hand is there, actually you have the same photo of pathismography signal on your hand, so I can use your hand to detect your heart rate as well, as long as you don't keep it moving on your face. So it's just a matter of adapting this and working with this. So in my case, I have a limited amount of time and I'm the only one working with this, so I have to disregard every time that I see a face in the f uh, hand in the face, I have just to remove those frames and focus on the frames that I know are clean. But in the future, if I'm going to use this commercially, then you have to account for those kind of things as well. Uh, hi. Hi. Do you still not think that a quantitative study from like, for example, YouTube, uh, YouTube streamers and Twitch streamers, and then doing a machine learning on generally just a large sample size, wouldn't that be more effective than trying to do it individual on base, on like case to case basis? It could be. If you have a, a large sample group, you can actually detect emotion. But in the case you said, the YouTubers, you cannot be sure what they are actually feeling. So you would have to be very sure, okay, this person is feeling stressed, and then you can use the videos of all stressed YouTubers and then train a model. Of course, if you dump a lot of data, you can actually decrease the error and try to add a lot of people. But as I said, you can never be sure that you are actually contemplating everybody. And your algorithm might be biased. You might be only looking at YouTubers from Sweden, for instance, and not all YouTubers around the world. So you need female, male, all people around. Yep. Any more questions? OK, so I think that's all. Thank you very much again for coming. <laughs>